Okay, good morning everybody and Hazak Baru. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful uh, Thursday morning as we are studying together Perashat Terumah. And of course, like we mentioned throughout this week, the goal of studying about the Mishkan and about the vessels of the Mishkan, the, which is what our Perashat deals with, it's what we're going to speak about for the next few weeks as well. All of the vessels, the goal is not again that Hashem needs a building, He doesn't need a house to live in. The goal is that God should live in our hearts. Asuli mikdash veshachanti betocham. The pasuk says that you should make a temple, but ultimately the goal is not that I should be in it, but that I should be in you, in the people. And our job as we read and we study these perashiyot is to ask ourselves, what is the message for us? How does the Aaron pertain to me? How does the ark, what lessons does it teach me? What lessons do I learn from the shulchan? What lessons do I learn from the Mizbeach? What lessons do I learn from the, uh, from the Menorah? All of the vessels in the Mishkan really are talking to us. We even spoke a little bit about the idea that the Malbim shares that if you look at the uh, Aaron from a bird's eye view, it looks like a face. You had the Aaron on top, which is like the mind. You had a vessel here, you had a vessel there. You had a, the nose in the middle, you had the Mizbeach. You had the opening, the mouth. It looks like a face, the Mishkan. God designed it in a way to remind us that we have to, as well, make sure that our organs and our limbs are all in line and are all in sync with the vessels of the physical temple, the physical Beit HaMikdash. So today I would like to learn a little bit. We spoke about the Aaron. We spoke a little bit about the Shulhan. And today I would like to talk about the famous Keruvim. The Keruvim were the two angel-like figures that were on top of the Aaron. I'm going to show you a picture that is provided here, okay, in the art scroll. Take a look. You see the two angels on top of the Aaron. Okay, I don't know if that's a good picture, if you can see it. But either way, um, there was the Aaron was the ark. And we know in the ark were the tablets. Actually, the ark and the tablets were synonymous. If there's no ark, if there's no tablets, there's no need for an ark, by the way. Which is why in the second temple, when we rebuild the second Beit HaMikdash, we replicated all of the vessels. We made a new menorah, we made a new mizbeach, we made a new everything except for what? What was lacking in the, first, in the second temple? There was no Aaron. We didn't make a new Aaron. Why not? Matter of fact, we know that on, in the Beit HaMikdash, on Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the year, the holiest man enters the holiest place with a shovel and with a coals, and he does the service in the Holy of Holies. And he places the shovel on the Aaron. But when there was no Aaron in the second temple, he did put it on. Instead, he didn't use the Aaron. There was no ark to place it on. So he placed it on the Evin, on the rock, on the stone that was there from the beginning of time, we believe. Okay? And um, anyways, I think if you look at pictures inside the, uh, the golden mosque that's right now on Har Habayit, they may even have that, what they call that rock. It's all dug. You see, it's all dug. It's very cool, actually, if you see a picture of it. And there's just this one rock that hasn't been removed. And uh, legend has it that that's the rock. But either way, um, what's, what's uh, very interesting is that, the, let's read some of the verses when it comes to the Kirubim, when it comes to these very interesting angels that were on the Aaron. Okay. Um, let's just read from the beginning of Pasuk, Pasuk 10, chapter 25, Pasuk 10, and take a look. I want you to listen and try to see if you can notice right away the question. Okay, it's hard to really pick up unless, but someone asked me this question in shul this morning. Okay, that's why I'm bringing it up. Okay, so somebody actually did notice this. Okay, a friend of mine. Uh, and he says the following. Pasuk says, Ve'asu aron atzei shitim. Okay, make an ark out of wood. Two and a half. By one and a half, by one and a half, okay. And you shall tzipita, cover it, plate it with gold. Ve tzipita oto zahav tahor. What's zahav tahor? Pure gold. Membaitu mihus. So you're going to have a piece of wood, make a box out of wood. But then you're going to cover it from the inside and from the outside in gold. And make for it a gold crown. Ve asakta lo arbatat od zahav. You should make four gold uh Rings on each corner, one on each corner. What are the rings for? The rings is so that we can insert the poles 
when we move, we need to carry the aron and we carry it with these poles. So you inserted poles into the aron. Okay. Ve'asita badei atzeshitim, you should also make staves out of wood. And ve'tzipita otam zahav, and you should plate those as well with zahav. Ve'hevetarita badei matabaot, and you shall place the staves, the, the poles, into the rings of the ark. So, again, <clears throat> just to show you the picture, you have over here the, uh, you have over here the ark, and you have, you see the two poles on the sides? Okay? Two poles, one on each side. So, that's what we're talking about. And whenever we needed to move, we would pick up the aron. We don't touch the aron itself. We pick up the poles, and we carry the aron via those uh, two poles, on each, one on each side. Okay? And those, interestingly, the poles were always there. They never moved. Okay, the other poles, we only put them in when we were moving and we would need to transport each vessel. So then we would insert the pole to be able to pick up the keli, the vessel. But when it came to the Aaron, the poles, lo yasuru mimenu, the pasuk says, they shall never be removed. There's an amazing lesson here. The Aaron we know represents the Torah. The Torah, uh, the Torah, that's uh, the Torah that we learn. It's the rabbis that study the Torah all day. The what do the poles represent? The badim, the ones that carry the Torah? The poles represent the ones who support the Torah. Because the Torah cannot be studied without supporters. You have people studying Torah in Kolel. And we need those guys. That's where the Torah is going to come from. The future rabbis come from Kolel. They're not going to come from college. They're not going to come from university. Where, people, where are the rabbis trained? The rabbis are trained in Kolel. And we need the rabbis, but we know im en Torah, im en kemah in Torah. Without money supporting those rabbis, the rabbis won't have the ability to sit and learn. Without the supporters, there is no Torah. And by the way, the opposite is also true. Without the Torah, there's no supporters. If there's no Torah, im en Torah, in kemah, there's no money. And each one, it's kind of a yin yang, and it's a relationship that each one needs the other. And the staves represent the ones supporting the Torah financially. And what's interesting, if you take a look, when it comes to the Aaron, what does it say? Make it out of Zahav Tahor. What is Zahav Tahor? Like we said, pure gold. But when it comes to the staves, when it comes to the poles, what does it say? Take a look at the Pasuk. Pasuk Yud Gimal. Make it out of gold. It doesn't say Zahav Tahor. So my question to all of you, and I welcome you to join me and to suggest an answer if you like. You can write it, write it down. Why when it comes to the Aron, it has to be made out of pure gold. But when it comes to the staves holding the Aron, it could be only made out of regular gold. It doesn't need to be pure. Give it a couple of seconds. If you want to jot down your answers, please type quickly. Okay, you're on the right track. I like what you're saying. Jennifer is saying the Torah is pure, so it has to be pure gold. Whereas the supporters is the people, and the people have a yetzer so it's not always pure. Very good, very good. Keep taking that, but develop it a little bit more. Because again, the Torah is pure. But the ones who study the Torah, we have to compare the ones, the Torah, not to the Torah, but the ones who study Torah versus the poles are the ones who support the Torah. So take it a little bit further. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so Lena's adding to what Jennifer said, and that is that when it comes to the Torah, to the ones who study the Torah, the study of Torah has to be pure. The studying has to be Leshem Shamayim, beautiful word. It has to be altruistic. One Chas Shalom shouldn't study in order to receive Kavod, in order to receive honor, in order to look smart, in order to impress the people around them. The reason we study has to be purely motivated. Zahav Tahor, pure gold. But when it comes to the supporting of the Torah, when it comes to the people that are supporting, which is financially... There's no requirement that they be pure. Of course, it's very nice to be pure. It's even more beautiful if it's pure. 
But even regular zahav, that's not pure. The Gemara as an example tells us that if a person donates money and they say, I'm donating so that I could have a refu'ah shalema, sadiq amur, that person is 100% acceptable, 100% righteous. A lot of times people support a class, but they do it in a zeichut, in a merit, that someone should have a refu'ah shalema, in a merit, that someone should have an ilui nishma, that the person that passed away should go, their whole soul should go up. They do it in the merit that they should have a good uh, shidduch, or that they should have good business. Is that good or bad? They're giving for the wrong reasons. And the Torah reminds us that when it comes to supporting Torah, it's enough if it's zahav. It doesn't need to be zahav tahor. Even if there's a motivation that's not so leshem shaman, that's not so altruistic, it's 100% kosher. And that is the message uh, that we learn, again, by the way, from just a missing tahor. But why am I telling this to you? Take a look. Okay, you should place the stabs into the aron. Watch this. And then put the luchot. Now we come to the covering of this box. Anyone know what the covering was called? The covering was called, repeat after me, okay? Kaporet. Everyone say it. Kaporet. Okay? Not to be confused with the, another thing that was in the Beit HaMikdash, which had the same four letters, but different order, which is parochet. Okay? What was the parochet? Parochet was the curtain dividing between the holy and the holy of holies. Not to be confused with the kaporet, which is the covering of the ark. Okay? So there's a curtain, and then there's the lid on top of the ark. Ve'asita kaporet. Zahav tahor has to be pure. Amataim vachetzi orko. Two and a half. By. If the box is two and a half by one and a half. So the lid has to be also two and a half by one and a half. Very thin though. Not as, obviously not a thick covering. Ve'asita shnaim keruvim zahav, and you shall make, and here we go, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. Ve'asita shnaim keruvim zahav. Make now two keruvim. What's a kerub? Two keruvim are the, these angel-like figures that, that I showed you in the picture. So on the ark, on the cover, there was two statues. Very interesting, by the way, because it's forbidden to make a statue in Judaism. We're not allowed to make... Elohe uh, Kesev, Elohe Zahav. We can't make gods out of gold or silver, except for this. In the Holy of Holies, there are two statues. Okay, and make it on top of the ark. However, Pasuk says, Miksha ta'ase otam. You shall make them hammered from the same piece of block of gold that the covering is. Meaning, if I tell you I want two statues on my, uh, I'll give you a great example, okay? Many cars, right, at least many years ago, they have on the front lid a certain, their symbol. So if it's a Mercedes, there's the Mercedes sign. If it's a, you know, a Jaguar, it's a Jaguar, you know, sticking out, jumping out, right? A little, a little small uh, a piece of metal or something sticking on, right? Let me ask you a question. Is that sign, is that symbol, is that piece of metal made out of the same exact material and one with the hood? Of course not. They made the hood of the car and then they attached the image on top separately. Pieces sold separately, right? But when it came to the Kirubim, they weren't allowed to do that. They weren't allowed to make two statues and then glue them or whatever you want to do onto the ark, onto the covering of the ark. No, 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 no. They had to be made out of the same piece of gold as the lid. One huge block of gold and then make the lid and the statues at the same time. Right? That's very interesting. So question number one, why? Let's keep going. You should make one from this side. And the other on the other side. Make it like we say out of the same block of the lid itself. And they shall be covering with their wings over the lid. And they should be looking one at another. Towards each other and a little bit down. A little bit south. Okay? 
So straight and down. Place the covering over it. And what's very interesting, if you paid attention, when it comes to everything, it's Zahav Tahor, Zahav Tahor, Zahav Tahor. All of a sudden, when it comes to the Kirubim, it's enough if it's Zahav. Look at the Pasuk, Be'asita Shnaim Kirubim, Zahav. It's, it's an amazing concept. So the Kaporet has to be Zahav Tahor, the lid has to be pure gold. And then the angels that are on top of the lid, that by the way have to be made from the same exact piece of block of the lid itself, all of a sudden, no necessary, not necessary to be Zahav Tahor. It's okay if it's just Zahav. And again, another question, what in the world's going on? How, first of all, how is it possible? But really, why are we again leaving out Zahav Tahor? And one final question. What are these Kerubim? These Kerubim, Rashi says, Demut Partsuf Tinok Lahem. Rashi says, you know what these Kerubim are? These Kerubim are the faces of children. So these Kerubim, they had the form, the face of a child. They had these beautiful angelic faces. By the way, if you've ever been into these museums, if you've ever been in Rome, all of the ceilings, they, the, the artists, they painted little baby angels, right? Where does that come from? Angels with a baby face. It comes from the Kerubim, right? These Kerubim, that's really what the what was on top of the Aaron. There were these two angels with wings and their face was like a baby. So Kerub, according to this, is a face of a child. However, I want everybody to please turn to Bereshit. And there is another time that the Torah uses the word Keruv, the only other time. Besides for on top of the Ark, there's one other time that it says the word Keruv. And it's back in the beginning of creation. Chapter 3, after Adam sins, God kicks him out. And what does it say? We kicks him out. At the end of chapter 3, he kicks him out of paradise to work the land. Vaigadesh et Adam and he expels him. Vayashken mi kedem legan eden. And now look at this. So God kicks out Adam. And he stations east of the Garden of Eden et ha kerubim. Okay, in English, kerubs. And he places the kerubim. Wow. Veet lata lata herev amit hapechet and a fiery ever turning sword. To guard the way to the tree of life. So right now, okay, I don't know if this is literal or if it's spiritual or if it's a metaphor. I don't know exactly what's going on over here, very deep. But whatever it is, I'll tell you what it literally means. Right now, if you try to look for Gan Eden, you won't be able to find it. Because God put Kerubim and a turning fiery sword rotating very quickly that's going to chop your hands off if you try to get in there, Okay. So you can't get in. Okay? I don't know. Again, I don't know what it means. But this is what it says. So right now, there's these Kerubim blocking the way into paradise. What are these Kerubim? Well, what did Rashi tell us by us as a Kerub? A kerub is a beautiful, angelic child. Well, let's see what Rashi has to say over here. Eta Kerubim should be a, a child, right? You know what Rashi says? The Kerubim... Malachi Habala, angels of destruction. And the question is, how can it be that the same word, Kerub, in one place means one thing, and Kerub on another means something else? How can it be? Is a Kerub a child, or is a Kerub a, a destructing angel? Amazing question. And the Ketav Sofer is the one that asks this question. Uh, no, excuse me, not the Ketav Sofer. But the answer that's given, we're going to get to the Ketav Sofer in a minute. But the answer that's given over here, my friends, is something remarkable. 
You know, raising children is difficult. Raising the children, anyone that has children knows how difficult it is. And no matter what you do, there's always, they're always going to give you a run for their money. You want them to do this, they do that. You want them to be like that, they do the other. Raising children is not meant to be easy. Um, my mother told me one time she was talking to uh, Rebbitzin Altutsky, okay, a great Rebbitzin. And uh, she was mentioning how hard it is to raise children. And she, my mother said, you know, this is Tsa'ar Gidul Banim. This is the pain of raising children. And she and Rebetzin responded back, no, 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 no. This is not Sa'ar Gidul Banim. This isn't the pain of raising children. This is Gidul Banim. Gidul Banim, raising children is painful by definition. Okay? It's difficult. Okay? Anyone that has children knows how difficult it is. And they're fighting with each other and then you want them to be a certain way and they're always going to rebel no matter what you do. You could be the best parent. You could be a parent that's inspiring other people's children and for some reason your own children, when it comes to your own, they just don't listen. It's very difficult. And we're always trying to figure out, we're always reading par parenting books. We're trying to figure out what is the best way. And, you know, there's generation gaps that are discussed and there's always that one, you know, the child and then his children are religious, even though, you know, he himself wasn't. And there's just some things going on always. We're, we're scratching our heads. What do we do? And we have to remember that the Kirubim, the Kirubim, which represent our children. The Torah is reminding us something very powerful. Our children, our Kirubim, whether they end up being like angels or whether they end up becoming Malachi Habala, angels of destruction, comes down to one thing. And it comes down to what environment are they in? Sometimes a parent will call me and say, Rabbi, I don't know what happened to my child. Why? Can you talk to him? He wants to marry not Jewish. Rabbi, can you talk to my child? He doesn't keep Shabbat to the life of him. Rabbi, can you, can you talk to my child? He's going out and he's doing these crazy things. He's on drugs and he's on all these horrible things. And we wonder as parents, what are we doing wrong? What do we need to do to make sure that our children end up with like angels? And not, God forbid, end up malachei habala, destructive angels. And the answer is, my friends, it all comes down to what are we exposing our children to? Back in our perasha, where are these kerubim? The kerubim are attached to the Torah. The kerubim are right there studying Torah. They're in yeshiva. They're near all these positive influences. If we expose our children to Torah, then the result will be beautiful angels. But if God forbid, if we expose our children to the lahat ha-chelet if we're exposing our children like back in paradise, to the fiery, ever-turning sword, then the result is our children will become a product of their environment and they as well will be a malachi habala, a destructive type of angel. It's so scary. You read about what's going on in the news and you have all of these different, uh, you know, uh, book bannings and certain schools are banning certain books and they have the right. Every school has the right to choose what kind of books they want their children to read. And then you have all of these other people that are forcing them. No, you have, to, you have to let children read these books. It's very healthy for them to read these books. And uh, that's one of the biggest dangers, by the way, of putting our kids in public school, is that we're not in charge. We're not in control of what uh, literature our children are being exposed to. You know, one of the pros of being in a private school is we have to remember, you go to public school, they're letting kids read all of these books at a very young age. Very young age. Children that still don't know how to think and know how to process. And we have to remember, whatever our children read from a young age is going to stick forever. I'm not saying that we should hide our children from ideas like this, from certain things that are out there. There's, there's things that are out there that they have to be exposed to. There's things that eventually, when they get older, they're going to learn about. And that's fine. It's necessary for them to be educated. I agree 100%. But at what age? To let a, ch a child at five, six, seven, eight years old read about things that are crazy to our values, that are against the Torah values. And we're not in control when they're in public school. You know, one of the, one of the horrors of parents during Zoom, during Corona, is that now on Zoom, they're all of a sudden listening to all of these classes 
and what is actually being taught inside the classroom, and parents were horrified. Parents with, with traditional values, with Judeo-Christian values, conservative values, they're listening to what is being taught to eight-year-olds on a zoo, in, in the classroom. And they had no idea. They never knew because their kids are in school and the parents are at home. And all of a sudden, for the first time in Zoom and Corona, the parents are listening in and they're, holy cow, this is what they're teaching my child. And now there's a whole movement of discussing with the Board of Ed certain books and banning certain books and material as it should be. But we have to remember, what are we exposing our, chil our children to? What are they reading? What are they watching? Today, let me tell you something. You play uh, a, a, a kosher song on Spotify, you play a kosher song on Sonos, something very good on YouTube, and all of a sudden there are these ads, and yesterday I was in my house, I was playing on Spotify, I was playing a, just in my house, relaxing music every night, uh, Kumzit songs, all these kosher Jewish singers, and all of a sudden there's an ad that, you know, every 10 songs or whatever songs, there's an ad, an advertisement, and it's words that you can't even talk, you can't even say to adults, and they start talking about very disgusting stuff out loud on Spotify. And my, I, had to, I had to run, pause it. I was horrified. It's worth paying just to, to subscribe, just so you don't have, to, have to, to listen to these horrible advertisements. What are our children listening to? What are our children watching? What are our children reading? We have to know whatever they're being exposed to will determine how they turn out. If they're on the Torah, if they're on the Aaron, they come out beautiful, beautiful children. You put them near a, a, a sword, you put them near violence, you put them near language. We shouldn't wonder if a few years later they turn out to be destructive angels, destructive Malachi Habala. It's all about what they're being exposed to. And it's so important as parents that we do our job in ensuring that we're protecting our children. Of course, at a certain age, we have to educate them, we have to show them, we have to teach them. This is what the world says and this is what we believe. But only at a certain age. And our job as parents is to make sure that we are raising our children. Barabotai, going back to our question, why when it comes to the Aaron, it's to be built with Zahav, Tahor, pure gold? And when it comes to the regular Kerubim, it leaves out the, the word Tahor. All of a sudden by the Kerubim, it's enough if it's just Zahav. And this person asked me this question in Shul this morning, and I thought to myself, you know, maybe the answer is that when it comes to the Torah, the Torah has to be pure. There's no way around it. But sometimes we have a child who is not Zahav Tahor. Sometimes our children are just Zahav. Sometimes our children are lacking the purity. Sometimes we made a mistake as parents. Sometimes we let them, maybe we introduce them to inappropriate material. Maybe we put them in schools that they shouldn't have been put into. And they picked up bad habits or wrong influences. And now our children are no longer tahor. They're no longer pure. The Torah reminds us, even if they're not pure, don't give up on them. Connect them to the Torah. Teach them to the Torah. So many times, children that are so lost, the rabbis, uh, the, the parents come, they bring them to the rabbis, they bring them to educators, they bring them to uh, experts. And Baruch Hashem, they're able to find the spark that's still in there. They're able to tap in and connect to that child and to, to help them out of whatever they're going through. So even if our children are not as tahor as we would love them to be, says the Torah, don't give up on them. They're not Zahav Tahor. They're just Zahav. They're just gold. They're not pure gold. Beautiful. Don't give up. Keep, keep educating them. Keep praying for them. Keep giving them. Keep teaching them. Keep giving them love, love, and love no matter what they're going through. Even if they're not where we want them to be, we don't give up on them. And that is again learned from the beautiful word that's missing, the word Tahor. Even just Zahav will take it. Story is told. And we have one more question to address and then we'll end for today. And that is going back to the last question. Why, when it comes to the Kerubim, they have to be made with the same material as the, not from the same, from the same block as the lid. 
Like we said, one cannot make separately statue a statue and then glue it uh, onto the lid. It has to be made from the same block of gold as the lid was. Why is that significant? Stories told about two parents that were having a machloket. They were arguing. And the argument was exactly at what age they should start teaching their child Torah. At what age is it important for them to start educating the child. The child was two years old. And the father said, I think it's time a little bit, start teaching him Aleph. And the mother said, listen, he's still young. Let's wait a little bit. Okay. They decided to come to one of the greatest rabbis of the time. He said, Rabbi, our child is two years old. I think this, my wife thinks that, who's right? And the rabbi looked at them and said, unfortunately, I'm sorry to tell you, you are both incorrect. You are already two years late. The teaching of Torah to our children must come already from when they're born. Already from when they, they, they come out of the womb, we have to start asking ourselves, what are we going to do to raise our child in this crazy world? With the values of the Torah. Many parents put around the crib pictures of Gedolim, beautiful pictures of huge rabbis, huge scholars, pictures of the Torah, pictures of, of tzedakah, pictures of chesed, to introduce their children from the second they open their eyes, the first images they see should be these beautiful things. There's already so many studies today already acknowledging how important it is what photos we place in the cribs of our children. In the cribs. What kind of music they're listening to already influences their development. And what is the, what is the message again the Torah is reminding us? This, these angels, these babies right away have to be from the beginning of their inception. They have to be made out of the same block as the lid is made out of. It shouldn't be separate. The Torah teaching shouldn't come five years, eight years, 20 years into their, into their lives. It should come right away. The second they're introduced to the world, they're already connected in some way to the Torah. Even in the womb, correct. Even in the womb, it goes even earlier. What an amazing, amazing concept. Look how many lessons are about We learned just from the Kirubim. The Kirubim, again, reminding us that our children have to be introduced to the Torah, to be very careful what we're exposing our children to. What are they reading? What are they watching today? Let me tell you something. You have all of these innocent shows today that are not innocent at all. It doesn't matter if it's animated. It doesn't matter if it's rated PG. Today, the most innocent shows are teaching the most corrupt values to our children. The heroes of the shows are all people that are against our Torah values. We have to be very careful. Is, are these things that we want our children learning? Of course, the time will come where they're going to have to be introduced to it. But at what age, my friends? At such a young age, we have to be very careful. Their minds are very delicate. Their thoughts, their values, they're being shaped, they're being formed. And by the way, the world knows this. That's why they're so on top of trying to push these books down their throats. We have to make sure that we are doing the opposite. We have to make sure that we're removing these books from our libraries. We have to make sure that we are introducing only the kosher books, only the books with the values that we want our children learning. Our children will become beautiful angels, but only if they are on top of the Aaron. God forbid we, we expose them to these swords, we expose them to violence, we expose them to language, we expose them to all of these things out there. There's no shot that they won't turn out to be Malachi Habala. Okay, it's really in our hands. And no matter what kind of child we have, never give up on that child. He may not be as tahor as you want. Love him. Give him. Treat him with whatever you have. Give him everything that we have. That is what our job, our job is, Rabotai. So these are some lessons for the Kirubim. Hashem should help us all in raising our children. It's not easy. It's very difficult. It's real work. It's real avodah. But when we study these paragraphs of the, of the Mishkan, then we walk out with all these lessons. May Hashem help us in uh, inculcating them into our lives. Amen. We'll see you all tomorrow. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.